Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I invite you to join me as we explore what it looks like to choose joy in the messy middle while embracing the inspiration, intention, and action that you can take to find joy in your every day. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 286 here on Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, I am so delighted to have author Fred Waitskin joining me for a second time, this time to talk all about his brand new book, Strange Love. We're also covering the territory of how he approaches his creative process, which is, of course, one of my very favorite topics. And I cannot wait for you to hear all of the juicy tidbits that he shares about how he approaches writing and creating new work. Before we get to the interview, I want to give you all a very warm welcome and say thank you so much for tuning in this week and always. If you're new to the show or if you want to find out more information about Jumpstart Your Joy or myself, you can go to the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com and that's where you'll find all of the 285 past episodes along with Fred's first interview when he talked about deep water blues. I loved that conversation so much as well. And while you're on the website, be sure and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out each week. And it gives you that little reminder that there's a brand new episode out and you can tune in. I've also been adding in a few of my very favorite things each week with a quick overview of each of them. Usually there's a free course, something pretty maybe you want to buy for yourself, uh, a new book or something else to explore, or sometimes a little bit of info about a past guest or upcoming guests. So be sure to get in the know and sign up for that at jumpstartyourjoy.com. Also for this one, there'll be some episode notes where I link back to my previous conversation with Fred, along with his books, which include, of course, Strange Love, Deep Water Blues, and Searching for Bobby Fisher, which was all about the story of his seven-year-old son, Josh Waitskin, who was a chess prodigy, which you might really love if you've been watching The Queen's Gambit. Those will all be in the show notes, jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash 286. Uh, so the thing that I love so much about this conversation, and I cannot wait to share it first, it was such a treat for Fred to reach back out to me and ask if he could join me on the show because I think we had such a great time in our first conversation that we knew it would be so much fun to reconnect and talk about this latest book of his. And you'll find that we're talking about two things. One is this really delightful little book. It's about 114 pages and it's such a juicy little escape from what we've all been through in the last year. I think you're going to love it. It's a great story. It's so well written. And Fred leaves a lot of space for your brain as the reader to fill in some of those gaps and use your imagination and really participate in the story. It was it's really good. (laughs) The other thing that I love so much is I know so many of you are content creators of some sort. Maybe you have a blog or you write content for your own website or maybe you're a podcaster. And I love that Fred likes to share and talks about how he approaches the creative process. And so Fred is sharing a few of the things that he does to kind of get into the zone or how he approaches the craft of writing. And I I know you're going to love hearing about how he does intentionally leave room for the reader to participate in the work, how he leaves himself a little bit of a gap in between approaching new projects, and some of the insights that he has around how Ernest Hemingway approached writing himself. There are so many good takeaways from this conversation. I know you're just going to love it. So Let's just get started. Welcome back to the show, Fred Waitskin. Thank you. I'm delighted. I'm so happy to be back with you again. I remember our last talk was a great one. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And that was about Deep Water Blues. And yeah. that's also a really wonderful book. Thank you. Since we last spoke, of course, a few things have happened in this world. And I'm wondering if you want to just tell us a little bit about where you've been during the pandemic and maybe what, you're, what you've encountered and what your life's been like. Well, it's been a whirlwind. When... The virus became very, very bad in New York. Like a lot of people, I became very nervous, and I was shut up in my apartment, and I was pretty much nervous about going out, and um, I don't want to be too gruesome, but I mean, you know, there were portable morgues on the streets, you know, five or six blocks from my house. It was just, it was like war. It was terrible and so sad, Mm -hmm. and people in my office died. And I realized that my best chance was to get out of the city because it was a very dangerous place to be for that period of time. And my son has a home in Costa Rica. So I I left the city and I went down there for six months. 
and um, I felt safe, I felt comfortable, I felt loved, loved, and and I ran into this fantastic story that I um, turned into a novel. So in the short run, that's what I did. And then when things started to get better in New York, and we were able to get a vaccine, I came back, and I got vaccinated, and I made some revisions on my book, and here we are. I mean, that's yeah. a year very, very quickly. So there was bad stuff and, yeah. and very good stuff. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful explanation of what many of us saw, that there was so much hard and yet such an invitation to go inward and look at the things that really matter, even in the midst of loss and confusion and, and fear. And now in cost, you know, things are getting better here. People in New York are starting to take off their masks because they can. And in Costa Rica, where I just left, things are getting terrible because there's practically no vaccine there. There's no medication to speak of. The local people who are wonderful are getting sick in, in thousands. So it's just, you know, on the one hand, I, I feel blessed. I've come out of it okay. But people that I care for are getting sick. So it's a difficult time in our, our world today. It really is. And so, so interesting that, I mean, it was so hard here in the United States, but then we do have the benefit and the privilege of having a vaccine and other countries are really suffering. And I think there's such, there's like a deep sense of heartache, I think, for me, for sure, about what's going on and how that impacts the global sense of well-being. It's really, really sad. It sure does. Sure. It's, a, it's a very amazing time in our lives. Who would have ever mm -hmm. thought that this was going to happen two years ago, right? Who could have imagined it? It's like a Never, world war. Never, would have guessed. It really is. It really is. And I've read almost all <laughs> Strange Love, and I really enjoyed it. It really, it reminded me because it's kind of a short little snippet of a story, and I love that about it. It's not very long. And it reminded me of the work of Penelope Fitzgerald. I don't know if you know of her, but she's a British author, and she writes these delicious short stories. Like, she's one of my favorites where you don't get everything and it leaves you this space where your brain and your own experience can kind of fill in the gaps. I don't know if that's what you were going for at all, <laughs> but I felt like there was a lot of room for the reader to participate in ways that's not always present in written books, but like I could participate and fill in some of the gaps with my own experience. That's uh, Was that any of your intent? <laughs> that's, frankly speaking, that's an astonishing perception. Because I've written about this subject, mm. and, and part of my prose style is, is that I, when I work with young authors, I, in fact, I was having dinner with a very, very talented young writer last night who was writing a novel, a terrific, terrific book, and I was urging him to um, not be afraid to take, off, take out sentences and paragraphs, because as I explained it, I think that the, the reading process in, its, in the deepest, best sense is a kind of duet between the reader and the writer. And the reader does, if it's a good book, the reader does a lot of the writing. So your perception is very interesting to me because it's part of my, my style is to leave the gaps so that the reader is a participant. Rather than crowding every moment with more and more and more words, I tend to take out words and sentences and paragraphs mm -hmm. and let you, you participate. I think that's, uh, it, it pleases me that you, that you notice that. Mm, yes. Well, and it was, I felt like this was even more open than Deepwater Blues. And I, I couldn't explain it. It felt like there's a dreamy quality to this book and the way that you've written it. And there's very much, I mean, I know from our last conversation that you tend to pull pieces of reality in your own life and, and stories you know from living them into your work. And I felt like this book more so than the the last one had that very, that had that sense of like, I could feel like I was weaving in and out of like, is this real? Is this, is this reality? Is this just memories? Is this, you know, is this the characters themselves? And I don't know, is, I guess my first question, is the main character who, does he have a name? Did he get named in the book? No, he doesn't get named. He's the nameless That's narrator. Right. And I, I thought about it while I was writing the book <laughs> and I kept thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll name him. And then I, I got further into the book mm -hmm. and further into the book. And then I said, you know what, let's leave him without a name. Um, but uh, you've hit on, a, on another theme that I've writ written a lot about in my, in my writings on the nature of writing. I, I, I also believe that, that all fiction comes from reality. I'm talking about good fiction, mm -hmm. not, not cheap books, but <laughs> thoughtful books by very good writers all come from reality. And I, I've made a little video that I'll put out on the internet on this subject. But like, for example, one of the characters in the novel is, is Rachel. 
She's the female character, the younger yeah. woman, right? And I've had this idea for a long time that, well, I've known people over the years that are fantastic storytellers. You know, you, you meet someone that works in a coffee shop, you know, or as a fisherman or, or works as, as an exterminator. They name that because it is an exterminator in this novel. And you sit down with this person and all of a sudden he starts, he or she starts to tell you a story. And it's like you're listening to this great yeah. story that this person is telling you who's not a professional writer. And I've known in my life, I don't know, six or eight people that have really impressed me for having this gift. My mother was a great storyteller, as a, as a case in point. Stella Waitzkin, she was a painter, but she was a great storyteller. And when I was growing up, I'd say, Mom, tell me a story. And she could just spin out a story. It was fantastic. It was like she was ready. She had stories built in everywhere. And I had a fishing friend who I used to see in the Bahamas. And he, he used to tell stories like he, he would talk about going to the, to the laundromat. And it was like filled with drama, just the walk from his house. And in this particular book, there was a lady that worked in a coffee shop a couple blocks from my office in New York. Her name is Shuman Lee. She had a very, very difficult childhood in China growing up left her alone in the house when she was six, eight years old. She had to feed herself. She had to go to school by herself. She had to uh, worry about someone was going to break into the apartment at night. For six and eight months in a row, this little girl had to take care of herself. And sometimes I'd meet her and we'd have a coffee at the end of her workday and she'd tell me these stories. And the stories were fantastic. They were like Hemingway short stories. So I started thinking about this when I got down to Costa Rica. Wouldn't it be interesting if, if the character you know, because I sort of had this idea about this town. I was exploring down there, and I was going from one little mm -hmm. seaside village to another, and I found out that these villages were so interesting. They had um, very unusual histories, and they had different sexual mores than we used to. I mean, bisexuality, for example, was common down there. And, and like, illnesses were treated with voodoo, you know, instead of doctoring. And the rules were all different down there. But anyway, this woman, this fictional woman in this fictional town that I call Fregata, is a natural storyteller. And so she tells a story to this guy that goes down there that mesmerizes him. And through her storytelling ability, he falls in love with her. So right. that's sort of where that came from, getting back to your point about the relationship between nonfiction and fiction. I mean, I think that like if you look at most of the great books that you know, that you like, I mean, if you think about an Ernest Hemingway novel, for example, uh, if you think of The Sun Also Rises, in the first draft of that novel, yeah. Hemingway called each character by the name of the person who he was writing about. And then in his later drafts, he took out the names and put fic fictitious names in. This is true about most good writing. So it's certainly true about my writing. Well, and I love that you just shared about that, the woman from New York, because her story's in there twice, right? Part of it sounds like it's the little boy and how he was left and he would cry for his mother, when his mother Sandra, when she was leaving and he didn't right. want her to go. That sounds right. like the little girl version of who you're speaking of. Is that, is that possible? You know, I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. You're hitting home runs with me today because I hadn't <laughs> thought of that. I hadn't thought of that, but probably that's where yeah. it comes from. Honestly, when I was a, a younger writer, I was a very slow, meticulous mm -hmm. writer. I worked on paragraphs for days, but as I've gotten... To be an older writer, I've learned the value of writing quickly. And, I, and I've learned that if you have an idea of where you want your story to go, and you don't ponder over it, but if you just write it very, very quickly in the first draft, there's a rewriting to be done. Yeah. You, you find some stuff inside yourself that you didn't realize was there. And so part of the writing process comes from a pre-conscious place. Now, this point that you just made is very interesting. I hadn't thought of it, but probably that's where it comes from. It's very cool, right? Possibly. Yeah, that is really cool. It felt like there were pieces, and maybe it's just the lens that each of us has that we bring to this book, but I felt like while the pandemic is not in the book, like there's no, no, no reference to it, it wove its way through in the most nuanced ways. And the little child, oh, this one's heartbreaking too, but I felt like that little child, I could see children who have had to be, you know, at home doing school and maybe their parents had to leave because they're frontline workers of some sort. There were so many children being left at home just to be on Zoom and do calls with their teacher. Like, I saw that little boy in, you know, the the public, <laughs> you know, the, in the American public this last year. And that, like, broke my heart. And the other one that got me, um, you mentioned the exterminator. 
there was a line about how the uh, so the main character for for the audience no spoilers but does go work as an exterminator and puts on the suit with the the goggles and the mask and the headband and I thought there is a dance right here there's a fine line between someone exterminating and all of the you know the protective materials we're putting on to keep ourselves alive like I don't know but I was that there for you when you wrote about the exterminator and what he was wearing I can't say that it was in the front of my mind when I wrote it but mm. we're teaching a course now on unconscious writing you know I mean these are very interesting points and <laughs> I and I certainly wouldn't deny that it was in the back of my mind I mean, I, I can't say that I yeah. was thinking about it when I wrote that character. To talk a little bit more about The Exterminator, which gave me great pleasure to write, I thought it was, I don't know if it struck you this way, I thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. My mother used to sing this depression song to me, which I, I won't be able to think about the words now that I'm doing this interview with you, but it's something like, you know, the refrain is, buddy, can you spare a dime? And the song yes. has to do with, once I built a railroad, now it's gone, buddy, can you spare a dime? The point being that, like, in life, there's an arc that befalls many, you know, that you have great hopes at a certain point in your life, and if you're lucky, you achieve a certain kind of success, and then very sadly, a fall takes place. And it's, it doesn't happen to, mm -hmm. to everybody, but it happens to many people. And in terms of the, the narrator of this book, and I don't think I'm giving away too much, I have to say a few things about it, right? I mean, I'm not, not going to give away too much. The narrator was a mm -hmm. successful author as a young man, and then he dried up as an author. And this is true about a lot of writers. They, they write one successful book and then they ha don't have much to say after that. And to survive, he had to do something because people have to do something to survive. So he mm -hmm. went to work as, a, as an exterminator, but he came to terms with it and started to, in a strange way, not even in such a strange way, accept the turn that his life had taken and came to enjoy it and came to enjoy his friendship with another man that worked in that company. And I think, again, that that... that is something that happens to people. Then, of course, he goes down to Costa Rica, and I won't tell you what happens because the plot changes. It switches gears. But it was fun to write the extermination part. I mean, I, I also I have to admit that if you were visiting me in my office now, you, you'd find out that the office mate right next door to me is an exterminator. You know, so I befriended a man that works there, and he told me all about the business, you know, so I knew what I was talking about. And... The other thing that I love that does weave through the story, there's two things that I saw that were such a delight. And one is Brother Can You Spare a Dime, the song, Bing Crosby, I believe, right. from about, what, 1929-ish? Like that. And then Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. Both were, like, beautifully woven in. And I, I felt like the characters, especially that main character, he almost was the embodiment of that song, because I looked up the lyrics and the first bit being about building a dream. And I was like, you're right. Like this guy has tried to build a dream. And then the theme of so many times what we see happen in our lives is that we think we're going for one dream. Well, I won't give it away, but he doesn't get there. But then the dream changes and we realize maybe what we find and what we have is I don't even a better fit or more beautiful or it didn't need to be the size that we thought it needed to be. And I feel like the main character kind of lands in that space. So it was really neat to see that song come on through. And lovely to hear that your, you said your mother loved that song. She used to sing it to me when I was young. She had a sense for the beauty and the tragedy of life. You know, she was a, she's a, she was a very remarkable painter and sculptress. She did many great sculptures. Her work is in museums everywhere. But she was a real writing influence to me. She wanted me to be a writer, and she kind of cultivated that from when I was a young boy. It was a delight to see that weave its way through. Because it also feels a little bit like, I mean, you kind of mentioned that this feels like it's been a world war, kind of in magnitude and loss. And it felt like that was also a song. I'll link up to it in our episode notes so people can take a listen. But it felt like the kind of song that kind of has an echo for us now, just in the idea of we'd been in such boom times and now things are very, very different. So, yeah was kind of satisfying to see it in there. <laughs> the other one I really loved was your character of Miguel, who's a fisherman. Would you talk about Miguel a little bit? Because his story is really lovely as well. Well, Miguel um, was a delight for me to write. Maybe because in my personal life, fishing has been a big thing. Um, I started fishing with my dad when I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. And 
I fished passionately for years. I've owned my own boat. I've owned a number of boats, you know, smaller boats and then eventually a larger boat. And I've competed in tournaments and I've won tournaments fishing with my wife. And I have a great passion for fishing. But and I think I ascribe this to my, grand, my grandson, Jack Waitskin, who's, who's nine years old. He'll be turning 10 in October. My grandson is a vegetarian, and he became vegetarian when he was six and became very sensitive to the idea of hurting animals and hurting fish. And the idea of eating animals or killing fish is terribly painful for him. And I'm, I'm proud of him, the way he's grasped hold of this feeling at such a young age. I mean, even when we all have dinner together at the table, if we're eating meat, which we occasionally do, he'll go to another table and, and sit by himself because he can't stand the smell of it. So he's really an idealist at such a young age. And mm. it's caused him great pain that I am a fisherman and that I love fishing. And he's pleaded with me not to do it. And it's pretty hard to give up something you've done since you were a kid yourself. But I find that it, it has affected me deeply as a fisherman. I haven't fished, well, you know, the pandemic time was not a very good time for fishing anyway. But when I started to create the, the character of Miguel, and this just sort of came out naturally, it wasn't something that I planned out, but it seemed like, wouldn't it be interesting if this fisherman, who was the greatest fisherman in his village, he had a reputation for catching more fish and bigger fish than anyone who'd ever lived there. And in fact, it, I describe a scene where he, takes a small boat way out into the ocean and catches a huge marlin because he'd read The Old Man in the Sea when he was a kid and wanted to see if he could duplicate the effort. But then when he comes back to shore with this enormous marlin lashed to his outboard, he only feels remorse about it. He feels devastated that he killed mm -hmm. this 14-foot fish. And soon after that, he gives up fishing. And there's another scene, which I won't describe, where he catches a, a very, very large fish from the shore and lets go. But I think this was inspired by my grandson, Jack. Mm. I don't think I would have written those scenes that way four years ago. That's beautiful. Well, because it really, it is a retelling of the old man in the sea in a way. It was, yeah. And I, I really like the character of Miguel and just the hardship and the heartache that's described it because it ties back again to that dream being different. Kind of like for the main character, the narrator. Narrator. <laughs> narrator. <laughs> That it was so different for him that he thought the dream would be this one thing and then it wasn't really that, but it was something close and different or maybe not so close. But I, I loved the resolution of the character of Miguel and and I felt like his his arc, as you're saying, when he was working on that other fish, I really loved the imagery that you put forth of how he, he all right. had the premonition that there was something there that he was supposed to go get from the sea and then kind of the sparkling, like the oily water and the, the sparkle on the water of the little feeder fish and all of that. I felt like it was this really interesting parallel to some of, there's a lot of sexuality in the book, which was interesting as well. But it almost felt like the way that that had happened was it was kind of like the flashes on the water. Like you notice it first, but the sexuality was actually... There was something deeper to it because it seemed like the character, um, is it Rachel? Like she really wanted something deeper, just kind of like the fish <laughs> was deeper under the water than the flashy delights that maybe the narrator saw at the first. But I really, I don't know if that was meant to be a parallel, but it felt like it really was. And that many times our dream, we think it might be the sparkly thing up top, but it's actually the thing that's way below it. It's so I really, I really appreciated that scene. You know, yeah. when you write a book, it's so strange when a smart reader says things about the book that you've written that you hadn't quite thought about. You know, a couple of readers have said to me, there's, 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 there's a lot of sexuality in this book. I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have thought, I wouldn't have thought so. If you'd said, if you'd said to, to, if you'd asked me the question, other than the fact that I've heard it now a few times in the last two mm -hmm. weeks when people have talked about the book a little bit, I wouldn't have said that. I wasn't aware of it. I knew there was some sensuality in it, but I don't think of it as a sexual book. But I guess it's there. I think you're right about Rachel. I think Rachel is looking for something deeper, something that's below the skin. Mm -hmm. I think that's very fundamental to who she is. Yeah, she's a real anchor. I like her. No pun intended. <laughs> Everything else kind of swirls around her, even. I liked her a lot. And the sexuality in the book is interesting because as a reader, it's there and present. 
But then it, it quickly drops away. I mean, the first of the book, I thought, oh, is this what this is going to be about? Keep going. And, and no, not really at all. But I think that's also interesting that you wouldn't have seen it as the author. But I think that kind of goes to that, like you were writing kind of from that, I think you even said in the last interview about something about a preliminal place, like of, it's not really like you're like, I've sat down to write this thing. It's more about here's here's the story as it comes through. I, I, I remember many years ago in the Paris Review, maybe 25 years ago, I read an, an interview with Ernest Hemingway. And he said that I, I, I kind of learned to write from Ernest Hemingway. I, my mother gave me The Old Man in the Sea when I was 10 or 11 years old, and I read it in Life magazine where it was first published, and, and that's where I learned what great writing could be, and I fell in love with it. In this interview, Hemingway said that every time he sits down to write, he tries to write better than he can write. Think about that. Every time he sits down to, to compose a paragraph, every day, he tries to write something better than he ever wrote before. And I guess I was in my middle 40s or 40 years old when I read that. I tried to figure out what he meant, and I, I couldn't figure it out. It just didn't make sense to me. But about 10 years ago, I figured it out. And I alluded to this before at the beginning of our talk when I talked about fast writing. Because what I came to understand is that if you, if you write very quickly without thinking through every sentence before you write it, then you, you're able to get to a, a pre-verbal place in yourself and make discoveries that are deep in you that you never would have found if you consciously labored over each paragraph and said, okay, now in this paragraph I'm going to write this, this, and this. In the next paragraph I'm going to write that, that, and this. If you just let it flow, so like when I wrote this book, for example, let's say I didn't really have formal chapters in this book, but you can delineate chapters kind of like little marks on the page. If you look closely, you can see mm -hmm. they're two and three page mini chapters. And like for a mini chapter on a three by five card or on a piece of paper, I might write two sentences. This is what I want to cover. And then I just let it rip. Mm -hmm. I just let it rip I, without any idea of what was going to come. And that's where I've, I've found in the last eight or 10 years that I've made great discoveries in the writing, not thinking it through so much, trying to let it come from down, down deep, you know, sort of like a blues player you know, or a, jazz, a great jazz artist. Yeah. So yeah, that's become an like important that. part of my style. Now, Jack Kerouac, you know, yeah. I don't want to get too much into writing mm -hmm. history. Jack Kerouac talked about that, but he pretended that he never rewrote. I don't, I've never believed that was true. I believed he wrote very quickly and then he worked very hard on his sentences afterwards. I do. I take those fast paragraphs and work on them yeah. until I have them the way I want them. And isn't that interesting? Because I think then there's, when it's a fast write, then there's the, obviously your your work on it, but it also does leave some of that room for the reader. I, I would think, you know, if you're toiling over every description and getting it just perfect, you know, so that you can control the whole scene, then it doesn't invite the reader in as much. That might be more Dickens. <laughs> you know, he, that, that man really loved a good, here it is, right. let's describe it over five pages, <laughs> which is, is also an art. And his foreshadowing, of course, was way, di way different. But interesting to really see where people probably, where their, their own love of the art was. Right. One of the things that I really loved was there's also a moment from the narrator uh, that you wrote, or he wrote, <laughs> as a writer, I always found love relationships with unequal measures of attraction and commitment most interesting. And I just felt like this was like kind of a little wink from Fred Waitskin going, I'm here. It was almost like the fourth wall dropped. I don't know if there's a fourth wall. <laughs> there isn't film, but like that dropped for us. And we could see that there's a narrator, but there's also a writer. I don't know if you want to talk about that moment a little bit, but it it felt like some of the aha moment for our narrator. I mean, your, your reading of it is, is equally valid to my writing of it. What I meant was m perhaps more literally what the words said. In other words, I've always found disequilibriums in relationships more interesting to read about or to write about. Maybe to live them, mm -hmm. it might be more painful. The narrator's relationship with Rachel is certainly a painful relationship to a certain extent. There is a, an imbalance at least initially in the book, about the attraction that each of them have for the other. But I find that very right. interesting as a writer to take on, rather than just a love story where just it, it's splendor in the grass for both of them from the beginning to the end. It's, to, me, to, to me, that bores right. me a little bit. And I also think relationships evolve. Like, if I were going to write about what happened between the narrator and Rachel in the next volume, which I don't plan to write, but if I did, 
maybe the equ equilibrium would go the other way if I was writing the, if I was writing that novel. Mm -hmm. That's possible too. Well, and the equilibrium when it's a little uneven like that are is far more realistic. I'm just thinking of like Disney stories. Like that's never realistic. There's also nothing ever past the wedding <laughs> that we see in those stories. So like what kind of thing are we setting children up for? But it's much more interesting probably for the reader for the tension to exist and it's more realistic because I don't think we walk into most relationships where people are equally matched completely and how do we navigate that space? I think then you want to know more. And it probably lets the reader fill in the gap a little more around. And if you walk into the relationship, whether it's in, in a fiction or a real life, and all you hear is we're madly in love with one another and we agree about books and we agree about movies and we agree about, then you know they're lying, right? <laughs> don't you? I mean, it doesn't really work that way in life, I don't think. No, it doesn't. And then there's relationships where the only thing you have in common is that you both like really crispy French fries. And that's not a good one to hang on to either. But also, to be completely honest, I have to say that my parents had a terrible marriage. They didn't like each other at all. You know, so, so maybe to a certain extent I, I was influenced mm. by that in terms of you know, my predilections in terms of writing about relationships. Do you see a second installment of, of this story? Is there something else there brewing for you? You know... I have no answer to that. I have writer friends, and as soon as they're finishing a novel, they're ready to start the next one. And while they're finishing a novel, yeah. they already have the next one half plotted out. And I've never had that gift. Like, I've always found that if I try to, mm. to write the next novel, as soon as I finish this one, I end up writing the same novel that I just wrote again, because the pages are still in my mind. I might write a similar yeah. chapter that I've already written. And I need to leave a gap of time. And then for me also... Mm. Writing, finding the subject for a book, it doesn't have to be a novel, but let's call it a novel for this conversation. I have to fall in love with it. I have to fall in love with the story. If I don't fall in love with the story, you won't fall in love with the story. So it's always a, it's always a challenge, and it's sometimes a difficult challenge for me to know what's coming next. I don't really know what's coming next. Is it possible that I could write about those characters in a second installment? It's possible. It's not something I'm planning to do, but it's possible. I find that to be interesting because for sure this one and Deepwater Blues have a similar feel to them. They seem to take place in the same kind of space and time. And maybe that's the connection. Like it's a space that you love so much and and so those pieces come naturally. That's super interesting about The Gap. I'm also just thinking about that from a creator con of content kind of space that, you know, as a podcaster, I do my own shows of my own content too and sometimes it, the ideas do come fast and easy and it's like I can just write them down and then I've got three episodes and then there's sometimes where I'm like I got nothing like I don't know <laughs> I mean joy's not the heart of a topic but kind of taking the pause is maybe part of the magic too yeah I mean and there yeah. is, and there really is magic That's I mean like insight. I was saying to this writer friend that I had dinner with last night very very gifted writer yeah. it's strange you know like on a given day I'll be in my office and I'll want to write a paragraph after all this talk about fast writing, mm -hmm. now I'm going to contradict myself. I want to write a paragraph, mm -hmm. and I can't write the damn bat paragraph. I mean, I sit there, and I just can't get it. And then I'll wake up the next morning, and I, it just flows out of me. And what happened? You know, I went to mm -hmm. sleep. I woke up. Who knows what happened? There, there is yeah. a certain magic involved with planning good content for your program or, or writing a novel or writing a poem or painting a picture. You know, I mean, inspiration yeah. just isn't a word. I mean, it really is something that you make ineffable connections between things. F for me, being able to write also means making connections. Like, I always have to have two stories. In other words, if I have one story, mm. it might be an idea. It might be an idea. Like, for example, in this book that we're talking about, I had this idea of the storyteller in the village. But the only way I, I could write the story was, that, was when I realized that there needs to be a narrator, and the narrator has to have a history. And, that, and then the history of the narrator in juxtaposition to the history of the girl, Rachel, is what will make the story successful. And the tension that will exist between the two mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. So I have to find those elements. And finding those elements is sort of what inspiration is all about. Because, you know, like, you can walk down the street, and it looks like just a pedestrian street on one day. And you can walk down the same street the next day, and all of a sudden, you see things that you had not noticed before. And crackerjacks start to go off in your brain, and you're making connections, yeah. and all of a sudden you feel alive as a writer, and you can write it. But that has to happen for you in order for it to work. It's just not, it's just not mm -hmm. sitting down at the table and 
with a pencil and paper and magic coming out every day. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Mm. That's really interesting because Charles Schultz of the Peanuts fame, he was mechanical. I don't know if that's really the right word for it, but like he had such a system that he would sit down at the same time every day and I mean, he was drawing a comic, but that's creative. And do the same thing until he had this the comic strip done. And then he'd do it again the next week. Like, I don't, I wonder, I wish he was around to ask, how did that work? And maybe his, his you know, process was just a little bit different. It's really cool to hear varying processes. Different writers also are driven more or less, which is a part of it. It depends how much stamina and drive you have. I read in a part of a Philip Roth biography, that, that he worked 340 days a year, mm-hmm. for years and years and years. I can't imagine that. It's not that I, I dislike the idea of it. It's just that I don't have it in me. And then it's a question mm-hmm. of, for me, as I said before, it has to do with the juxtaposition between the gaps and a new idea. I, I need to fuel myself in order to sit down and write a book. It's just not working constantly. I, yeah. I, I would empty out and nothing would come out. I need mm-hmm. to yeah. to refill myself and then I can do it. You know, we're all different. Right. and. You know, and everybody has a different yeah. approach and what works for you. Well, and I think maybe the the aha moment there for me about it is that it really takes knowing that there isn't just one way. You know, like some people might think, no, I have to sit down and write 30 minutes every day and that's the trick. But knowing that, well, no, when you observe what you do and how you do it, be your process, it's going to be organic to you. So don't try and feel like you have to force fit somebody else's way of doing it to you to you because that's not going to be it either thank you for sharing that we talked a little bit about the pandemic is not in this book but the pandemic is in, yeah. is in this book i'm sure at some level just even by the inspiration of you having been to costa rica and that's part of i mean that's the location is there anything else that you could sense or know that kind of bubbled up through you as you were writing this book You know, the pandemic is interesting because, and again, it speaks to themes that you and I have been discussing since the beginning of our our conversation, because other people have said this to me also, you know, that this book sort of reads like an escape from the pandemic. I hadn't thought of it when I was writing the book, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I think it's an interesting connection. In a way, the imaginary village of Fregata is the perfect escape from the pandemic. I mean, maybe that was something that I was searching for. And I found it in my imagination. It wasn't just my imagination because I, I was scouting out little villages in Costa Rica and trying to figure out how people live down there. When I reflect on it now, it does feel like an escape. And it does, it does feel like it, it was connected to the pandemic. It's funny because like a lot of my writer friends and, and writer fans said to me when the pandemic hit, well, are you going to write about the pandemic now? And I said, no way. And people said, why? Yeah. I said, because everyone's going to write about the pandemic. All writers are going to write about the pandemic. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to just ju- join the, the club. But I guess if you're living in the middle of a world war, in one way or another, it touches you, and that was my escape for a while. Yeah, I know. Liz Gilbert wrote City of Girls after she lost her partner, and very much felt like it was kind of the fun escape the story that she wouldn't ever normally because it's it's loud and boisterous and out there and just really fun and I saw her give a talk about it and just that it is about that event of losing her partner but it it isn't about that event and it was allowed to be both it's like a it's like a shadow right yeah kind of a really fun shadow (laughs) shadows are really important in writing yeah so it's kind of a big evolution from my first book right searching for Bobby Fisher was a a big a big travel and I'm sure there's so many other interesting works that are bubbling up right now for authors that are like just out of this place. Like I'm sure there's, it was a hard year, but a rich place for creativity. I'm sure you're right. These events affect us in ways that we can't imagine. I mean, I think the backwash of this terrible thing that's happened to the world, we aren't even beginning to feel now. I mean, like the implications of children not going to school, of lovers being separated, of you know, of, I mean, of just the fact that for almost a year and a half, if you had a friendship with someone, to get a girlfriend, mm-hmm. a friendship, you didn't want to get near them. You didn't want to mm-hmm. hug them. It's a very interesting moment right now because like walking the streets of New York, I, I got up this morning to come up to my office and I was curious to see whether everybody would have taken mm-hmm. off their masks because the president said yesterday we should take off our masks. No one had taken off their mask. Everyone was yeah. wearing the masks. 
Everyone in the street was still, we, because we're so used to wearing the mask that we can't take the mask off. And if you think about it, you know, what does that say? It says, in a sense, at least to me, that we're not ready to be seen yet. You know, we've been hiding behind these masks now for a year and a half, and it feels uncomfortable to take the mask mm -hmm. off and take a look. And I think it's going to take a long while for us to get used to the intimacy that we might have had before. It's been a very chilling, profoundly disturbing period, yeah. apart mm -hmm. from the dying. Yeah. I was in L.A. for a couple of days, and I happened to see two friends there that I didn't know they were there, saw them, and we all had our masks on, and I said, oh my gosh, Darren, Michelle, and we put out our arms, and then we looked at each other like, and we all yelled, I'm vaccinated. And so then the hug happened, but it was like this, the initial, it was a very poignant moment of, I, there you are, I haven't seen you for them for years. I, my immediate reaction is to hug you, but then there was the, oh, we don't do that anymore. But then the, it was just a really interesting cascade of emotions and feelings. And then we were very happy that we could all hug each other. <laughs> and, and it was just like old times. And we were very happy for it. It's been such a, such a very strange year. One of the things that I'm asking people is about how they have found joy in what I'm calling the messy middle. But that would just mean any kind of hardship maybe that you've encountered or the pandemic, if that's what it means to you. And I'm wondering how... Fred, how you've approached joy in the messy middle or what joy has looked like during this time for you? Oh, I've spent a lot of the last year between between Costa Rica and New York. And during the, the pandemic, I spent quite a bit of time in Costa Rica. So I spent more time living with my son and his family and my wife, who lives down there most of the time, than I had for a while. And so I found myself finding joy in little moments, like my son has a, has a dog named Osa. It's a beautiful little shepherd. And going for walks with him on the beach was beautiful. And hugging my grandchildren was a great source of pleasure for me, and I think a pleasure for them also. And having great talks with my wife and with my son, which we hadn't been doing so regularly for a while, was beautiful. Little things like that, little, just little moments brought joy. I, I like that. Thank you. It is amazing how we it, it made us all maybe like get a little bit, well, just by nature of being closer to usually just a few people, but like the little bitty things, like even outside my, my window is my artichoke plant. that's large <laughs> and it's a source of joy. Cause I'm like, how does that grow? Like that's huge. And there's hawks that live uh, near us and just to go out in the yard and see them. And like, those are some of our neighbors and, and I live pretty in a pretty suburban area. So it's bizarre to see them, but all the little things that we notice around ourselves uh, that we probably never had stopped to see before have been really, yeah, it's been neat in the last year. And you realize that these little moments with family and with friends, I mean, you know, I'm back in the city now and I'm seeing friends that I hadn't mostly seen for a year and having great conversations. And you realize that the little moments in a way mean more than the big moments. I've had some luck in my life as a writer. I'll tell you a very bizarre thing. 33 years ago, I wrote Searching for Bobby Fisher. And the book did okay. It didn't do great. It did okay. And then the movie was made, and it did better. But then, but then, and this is one of the strange things in life, they made a, a they made this Netflix program called The Queen's Gambit, which did you have you noticed it on? T I haven't yeah. watched it. And a lot yeah. of people watched it. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. It was really pretty good. But the amazing thing is that it reawakened the interest in my first book. And today, before I came on your show, <laughs> a friend of mine send me a text. And he said, take a look at the Amazon bestseller list. So 15 minutes before I came on your show today, I took a look at it. And my book was number one. Number one. <laughs> I hadn't realized that. Isn't that crazy? I wrote it 33 years ago. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And it's wonderful. And it's, and it's a thrill. But the little moments that we were just talking about before, probably I would have felt different about it 40 years ago. But now the little moments are the moments that mean the most to me meeting a friend for dinner that I really care for, spending time with my family, you know, having a good conversation. Those are the great moments. Well, and I feel like that little bit of news also kind of ties back into the theme in the book of that that dream that we're building doesn't always look the way that we think it will 33 years prior, right? <laughs> like, no, you never, it look, you never it looks knew. completely different. Yeah. When you're just starting out as a writer, you know, you think that if you have some enormous success, it's going to make your life really the greatest life in the world. 
you know? Yeah. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. still, it's just your life. Well, if some find um, Strange Love or Deep Water Blues or Bobby Fisher, <laughs> where would they go? I think the best place to, to find them is, is, is on the internet. Of course, you can get searching for Bobby Fisher in most bookstores, but it's always sold at good dis discounts on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. They all carry it. And I hope you read it and like it. <laughs> It was a great pleasure writing it. Yeah, it is a, it's a good one. And it was a delightful thing talking to you about it. You made such interesting points, really. <laughs> thank you, Fred. Um, it's been a real treat to get to have you on and talk to you about it. So thank you for joining me. Thank, thank you for asking me. Fred, thank you so much for joining me this week on the show. It was such a treat to be able to speak to you again and to go over some of this, some of the little nuances of this book. It's such a delight for someone like me to be able to speak to you about a book that I really enjoyed reading. So if you want to find your own copy of Strange Love, you'll find a link in the show notes at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash episode 286. And of course, there you'll find links to the first conversation that I had with Fred about Deep Water Blues, and you'll find a link to Searching for Bobby Fisher, which is the book that he referenced at the end that's all about chess. And while you're on the website, be sure and sign up for my newsletter. Or if you just love this podcast so much and can't get enough, if you are not yet following me on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere that you get your podcasts, be sure and hit that follow button so that you'll get these episodes each week automatically delivered to your ears. So next week on the show, you guys, th these are a couple really good weeks. I'm so excited to be joined by Sonia Renee Taylor. And she is, of course, the author of The Body is Not an Apology. It is such a treat to get to have her on the show. She has also just released a brand new workbook that goes along with that original book and an updated version of The Body is Not an Apology. And so she's coming on and we're going to talk about mm, some good stuff about how to determine is joy just joy in the moment or is it joy that's good for all of creation and all of humanity. We also talk about how the Genesis story in the Judeo-Christian belief system kind of sets us up for tricky territory because it's all about how we can't trust ourselves and how do we get past that to be able to dive into radical self-love. And so I know you're really going to love this conversation with Sonia, and I cannot wait to share it next week. So be sure and come back for that. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy. <laughs> <laughs>